Hey all, we're concluding our look at creating effective, safe, scaffolded learning environments. In this, we're looking at chapters 9 and 10 from the text. Specifically, we're thinking about how do we manage chronic behaviors. We're looking at some of the alphabet soup. Uh, for some reason, in our classrooms, in our schools, we love, uh, you know, naming systems. We love uh, having different uh, you know, names and structures uh, for behaviors and for interventions. We're going to talk about teacher self-care and wrap up things for our look at creating learning environments. Specifically in this, we're thinking about how can we uh, think about chronic behavioral issues? How can we track and keep records on all this? We're going to think about FBAs, BIPs, um, PBIS, once again, that alphabet soup. Uh, and most importantly, we're going to think about wrapping this all up together to think about teacher self-care and how do we uh, think about ourselves, how do we try and identify ways that we can be an effective classroom teacher. So one of the challenges that we have in our classroom is that oftentimes we will struggle with a student that doesn't uh, really follow along with or subscribe to what we'd expect to see in the classroom. Um, so we might see uh, a student that, uh, you know, like Jenny, um, you know, that we're trying to deal with a situation. We move the student, we change their location, we give warnings, we take away privileges, we call home. We pretty much try every trick in the book, but nothing else is really happening. Um, I've dealt with this situation a lot with numerous students, multiple years, um, and you know we we get frustrated when we try pretty much everything that we are supposed to do, but nothing seems to work, uh, and we cannot fix or address a lot of this. One opportunity is to contract out the behavior. What that means is have a written agreement that defines the specific student behavior. Uh, right from the outset, communicate positive expectations with the student, uh, provide rewards, uh, the teacher and the student sign off on this contract. We are very clear about the consequences and rewards involved in this. Um, and one of the things that we uh, consider is that removing the student, totally removing the student from the environment really should be the last resort in all of this. Within this, there is a need to think about self-monitoring. So if you have a contract with the student, you want to identify exactly how are we going to pay attention to whether or not the student attends to the specific elements that you've addressed in the contract. And one of the things to keep in mind here is that we're really talking about self-monitoring. So we're building up the skill set for the student to think about their behaviors and how they pay attention to those over time. So in self-monitoring, we might have the student use a checklist to record their behavior. Student might self-rate, um, and then the teacher would review this rating. We want to keep it simple. Um, this is not supposed to be extra work on top of or much extra work on top of what the student's normally doing. Uh, so we might want to have this be three to five items and then, you know, but also it is work. So the student should see, okay, so now I wasn't doing the normal work that you had assigned for me. So now because of those behaviors, now I'm doing extra work on top. And then the idea is some of the logic here is that we're going to wean the student off of that as behaviors improve. Um, so, okay, you're, you're, you're doing what you need to do. So now you can um, you know, exist like a normal student in the classroom because uh, you're attending to these behaviors and you're aligning yourself with the expectations of the class. So there's a lot of different charts to do this. You can have this be a paper chart. This could be something that's online. Um, this could be a, a, a laminated sheet that the student marks off each week and cleans. Um, but basically, what are the things that they need to work on? So on the left side of this, you would identify three, four, five behaviors, and then they sort of like check those off throughout the week if they're doing it or not. If you want to get a little bit more in depth, you want to think about later years, maybe middle school, high school, you might have 
uh, target behaviors, um, and a, a full contract and tracking form. This might be something that goes from school to home, and the student is basically identifying, okay, did I meet these target behaviors across my classes? Um, and then uh, the, the student and the teacher would indicate whether or not this was successful, this would go home, and then pretty much this is a way to document behavior. So if you're having chronic behavioral issues, challenges in the classroom, the student is disrupting the learning of others, this might be an opportunity to document this over time and, and pay attention to it and create that paper trail and build communication with home. When we think about uh, tracking students and monitoring students, you want to uh, track behavior and your actions as well. So there are ways to do this via technology. There's different apps. Um, you can obviously have just a little uh, checklist in your uh, teacher plan book or your grade book, um, but you can also use technology. So you can mark off how many times you talk to a student, how many times um, you have to uh, give warnings and stuff like that. But you can also monitor behaviors using tools. And this is something that you can align with your grades and attendance very easily um, so that you keep track of things. So this might not be something that you pay attention to for all students, but some of those chronic behavioral issues you might, you know, if you have a class of 25 students in early childhood elementary, you might pay attention to two, three students that you need to document and monitor these behaviors. Middle school, high school, you might have four or five sections of a class and you might have one, two students across each class that you sort of monitor their behaviors um, and, and pay attention to that. Um, so it's important to keep a system in place so that you can pay attention to that. One of the first aspects of the alphabet soup that we're talking about is an FBA, a functional behavioral assessment. The primary logic in this that is that behaviors happen for a reason. Uh, behaviors and chronic behavioral issues are not uh, something spontaneous in the classroom. Yes, there are times uh, that behaviors are just spontaneous, but for the most part, behaviors happen for a reason. Uh, behaviors in FBA framework are, are seen to happen in response to an event. So we have an antecedent, meaning something that brings about the behavior. We have the resultant behavior. And then we have consequences. So behaviors are impacted or affected by consequences that follow. So we have this timeline or this cause and effect in an FBA. If it, we have an FBA team in a school, a functional behavioral assessment team, we bring together teachers, both general and special ed teachers, parents, counselors, psychologists, and we look at the behavior of a student, the FBA team will come together and say, okay, they, they conduct an interview or questionnaire, they, they look at the frequency, the severity and duration of the behavior in order to identify exactly what is going to be the response. So as an example, we might have a fourth grade student, uh, no identified disability, the special ed teacher, the building or the special ed uh, he, uh, head would say that there's no real disabilities or IEPs or behavioral plans that we need to attend to. Um, the setting would be we would have uh, this is going on in a general ed classroom. There's 18 students in the class. The teacher is nationally board certified. There's one student intern, so it doesn't appear to be a problem. The learning environment you know, generally we would say that the classroom is functioning the way that it should. Um, and then the concern is that that student is aggressive with others out in the playground. They're aggressive in the classroom setting. Um, and there is frequent off-task behavior from the student, and we're trying to figure out what is happening. So one way to um, identify exactly what's happening is, the teachers and that F and that FBA team, they would monitor behavior for a little bit. They basically pay attention um, and document this in some sort of data flow. Um, once again, we're we're tracking these behaviors, we're we're documenting things over time, we're creating that paper trail. So there might be a, a form that we're keeping track of all this. So we might say, okay 
we what really what percent of the time are these behaviors occurring? Does it happen when uh, you ask them to perform a task? Does the when the problem behavior occurs, do peers respond to it? Um, what happens most of the time and what percentage of the time? And the goal of this is to examine what are the underlying antecedents to the behavior and then the result behavior and then the consequences to try and figure out what's the the pattern in all of this. We also look at BIPs, behavioral intervention plans. This is an individualized plan for monitoring behaviors. In this, we set goals for student behavior. We offer replacement behaviors. Usually these align to, these should align to the accepted behaviors for the classroom. Um, that you set out uh, in, you know, earlier. Um, you should provide responses to problem behaviors. Um, we might need to embed more services in different placements. We might need to adjust those. These behavioral intervention plans should be brief um, and we should be consistent. So meaning that we shouldn't invent new things for students because they are not respecting our authority. A little bit more further down the path, we talk about PBIS. You should have already taken a look at some PBIS uh, throughout this. This is positive behavioral interventions and supports. Uh, some of this came from University of Oregon and uh, our look at IDEA. Um, and the goal of this in PBIS uh, systems and frameworks and ideologies is to build student self-regulation, build student uh, facility with positive behaviors. Generally, PBIS, as opposed to the earlier pieces that we looked at in this alphabet soup, is school level. But this is something that if you don't have it at the school level, you can apply it at your classroom level. If it's successful, generally schools are willing to, if they see something working at a classroom or a grade level, they might bring it across the whole building. Once again, it depends on teachers buying in other teachers in your building. Generally, this is um, research-based. This is scientifically validated. We're taking a look at uh, ways to help students increase self-regulation and positive behaviors. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is this is also focused on prevention, early intervention uh, in the model. So once again, we're thinking not about a, a uh, responsive element, not a responsive component where I see a student behavior, I don't like that, it doesn't align with my classroom, it's disrupting learning. We're trying to look two, three steps before that and figure out how can we uh, intervene and prevent before this. Different components of PBIS. We'll look at uh, modeling in this system we'll think about consistency in the learning environment you know across the whole school across the classroom we'll think about reward and consequences built into this model uh, clear effective uh, identification of classroom expectations um, and most importantly the community and the the caring community that you build that that culture in your classroom or your school so with PBIS, we're going to think about interventions. We're going to think about multiple interventions. Um, we might have a, uh, a primary intervention system that will work across the whole building or across the whole classroom. We're going to think about um, having a secondary level of intervention where we might identify current behavioral problems. So it could be a seasonal thing, you know, during a, a time of the year, like spring break, students act a certain way. Um, at the beginning of the year, students act a certain way. Around Halloween, we have to deal with candy, where we might not really have to deal with that elsewhere or costumes in the school. Um, and then there might be a tertiary, a very targeted, focused, um, severe set of cases. So this might be a violence piece. This might be... Uh, something uh, that's only a hot spot, you know, maybe a classroom has an issue or a grade level has an issue um, and you want to reduce the complexity and severity of some cases. And, you know, you might have multiple interventions going on at one time. 
So if we look at a middle school, I might have a uh, an intervention that's looking at uh, students in hallways and and remaining uh, focused in the hallway and quiet in the hallway. Um, but then I might have a grade level issue where my seventh graders are all trading Pokemon cards and that's leading to an issue, issue because students are losing or they're getting their stuff stolen. I might have an issue with, um, you know, my, my eighth grade students, my eighth grade female students and they're getting in fights over stuff. Um, so I might have multiple interventions all at the same time that I'm trying to pay attention to from a building leadership perspective. In this, it's important to collect data, track intervention data, and if things aren't really progressing the way we want to, we want to move on. Different ways that we can evidence this, you'll see schools that will have signs up talking about um, keeping the school safe. You might have schools um, that have acronyms that they subscribe to, like PAWS, and so students and teachers all know what the expectations are, and we we just say, hey, we have our paws here at the school. Um, you might have behavioral matrices, matrices where students will say, I soar here at Cliffside Elementary. So you might have some sort of acronym based upon the school or the school name. You might have behavioral matrix matrices um, that talk about how to be cooperative, safe, engaged, and successful in different spaces. So this one is based on the playground or the hallways. Um, you can have it be very simple, but multi, you know, multiple layers to this for a middle school audience. So generally, we're talking about being responsible, respectful, safe, and what this looks like in different spaces. Once again, a little bit more specific. Um, in thinking about a classroom community and a caring community, it's important to have multiple representations of that throughout the building so that students feel, or at least read, uh, evidence that they are cared for. Um, and you might see these hanging throughout the building, constant reminders of that PBIS framework so that they understand what their focus should be. Um, different uh, rooms. Uh, this is a little bit blurry, but you might have restroom expectations, and that will be just at the restroom area. You might have classroom expectations. Depends on how far you want to drill down into this in your building, in your classroom. Uh, we have school bullying, so maybe this is a secondary or tertiary intervention where the school is recognizing a recent outbreak in bullying, and then they want to sort of address that. Uh, the school counselor might have a specific set of expectations in that area to help support students. Um, you see school pledges um, in elementary school, maybe early childhood elementary. We have school pledges where students are expected to know some sort of mantra or expectations for that building. Um, and then in some PBIS systems, we have uh, a form of currency. So students can earn dollars um, that they can use at a school store or at the snack bar to try and uh, get some sort of benefit for follow, following the rules. Um, once again, it's important in all this, if we have chronic behaviors, it's important to maintain positive relationships with students. So that when misbehavior occurs, we can start from a place of caring and trust. I've said this multiple times, but a lot of uh, good can happen when we treat our students like human beings. Um, we want to deal with the present behaviors and work out a plan in this. Many times the plan or the plan should include the student. So they know that this is a serious deal that the teachers are talking and working with them and parents. Uh, we should discuss and review uh, the steps that have been taken to problem solve, have a paper trail and data to make that uh, audit. We should have class meetings um, on a daily or weekly basis with the student or parents or a team to discuss what's been working and how we can, uh, we can better support the student. 
And if we have a PBA as plan for the school or district or your classroom, we want to regularly review this and make sure that it's working. Um, some of the PBA as plans that you've seen um, have way too many acronyms and way too many, too much alphabet soup for my taste. Um, they tend to be a little bit too complex for my taste, but it ultimately depends on what you believe would work and is needed in your classroom. So one of the things I want to leave us with in this class is thinking about teacher self-care and making sure that you keep your battery charged so that you can be safe and effective in your classroom. So one of the things that I would suggest is early on in your careers, write yourself a letter, write yourself your mantra or guidance to uh, identify exactly where you see yourself heading and sort of like what the the guide rails are for you. So what are your aspirations, fears? How are you going to celebrate? Um, what will you monitor for positively or negatively as you continue throughout your career? Who are you going to turn to for support in this? Um, and then when the situation comes, when the time comes when you question your decision to be a classroom teacher, What's your self-talk? Um, because in any career, in any job, that time is going to come. It's not just education. We tend to focus on that because that's what we're doing. But that happens in law. That happens in police. That happens in marketing and retail. That happens pretty much anywhere. We question our decision about whether or not this was the right decision for us. What is your self-talk in that moment? And there's multiple ways that we can do this. Um, this could be something that we... We pull out um, at a later date. It might be uh, saving an email address to reach out to someone. It might be one of your faculty or your instructors from college. It might be, um, you know, a friend. It might be a parent. Um, it might be a mantra that you've seen in the past. But what are you going to do to try and uh, make sure that you are balanced at a later date? Once again, we know that effective classroom teachers we focus on behavioral components, cognitive components, but also affective or sort of like uh, non-measurable cognitive uh, elements, uh, psychological constructs. So the behavioral, we know that effective classroom teachers generally are effective, skillful classroom managers. We know that cognitively they can teach for lesson mastery. They know their content um, and they can teach it. So from a behavior point of view, I know how to run a classroom. I can get students to sit down and write things when I ask them to write it and read things when I ask them to read it. Obviously, there's much more behaviorally that we need to tend to. Cognitively, we know our content area. So I might be a middle school science teacher and I know my content and I can teach it. Um, but then there's also the affective side. Do you believe that all students can learn? Do you believe that all students can be successful? Do you generally have positive expectations for your students? All three of those components really need to come together to help you be an effective classroom teacher. As we close, um, we want to think about your beliefs about teaching and learning. We want to keep in mind your expectations about this. Um, we want to consider your background and your experiences as a student and your experiences as a learner and try and think about why you believe certain things about the teaching and learning process. Um, and last but not least, how are you going to operationalize that? How are you going to make that a reality in your classroom? And with that, we're going to close things up here. I really appreciate the time that we've spent together. Hopefully this has been meaningful to you. Please never underestimate the amount of power that you have in the classroom. You can create the type of culture and community that you want in your classroom, even if that culture and community is not existing in the room next door or two rooms down from you or in your building or your district. You can create whatever it is that you want to for your students. So with that, be well. This is not the end of our discussion or time together. If you need me or you want more help or support or you have those questions, feel free to reach out. Talk to you soon.